happened yesterday was that we had a middle of summer, or I should say beginning of summer, a nice rainstorm. <laughs> and it managed to nail all these plants and give them a good bath and a good washing. But it also kind of, we got arthritis, you know what it did. <laughs> And it's supposed to get back up to some pretty warm weather. And it ought to be interesting because you go from one extreme to the other. And, you know, sometimes our lives are like that. You know, you keep going pendulum-like. And God would rather that we daily seek His face and spend time listening to His voice that we might not be like a pendulum swing to go from one extreme to another but that we would have a gradual increase. You know, it's not always a mountaintop experience, nor is it always a valley experience. But life is, and that's the point. Life happens. Life has been designed for you to know Him. And knowing God, you learn that the more you read, the more you're grown, so to speak. It's like watering the plants. When you water them and you get the right amount of sunshine, they immediately respond and they pick back up and they stand up straight and they point towards wherever the sun is. And they seem to follow the sun pointing in that direction. Are you like that? No matter what happens in your life, you're always pointing to the sun, the Son of God. I hope so, because if you're pointing in any other direction, you're really not getting any help. You're just spinning your wheels and not accomplishing much, though you may be very active, but a hamster in a cage looks like they're going a long ways in a hurry <laughs> and they don't get anywhere at all. So, for me, devotionals and devotionals are the way to check in with God and to hear what He would have to say and what He would want us to do in our day. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. Even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth, he maketh sore, and findeth up. He woundeth, and his hands make whole. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. He doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of man. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father, father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, and he remembers that we are dust. You know, thank God he does. <laughs> I mean, let's be real. We're talking about God, and we're talking about you and me. Now, if you put God here and you and me, I think we're in trouble. <laughs> But because he knows what we're made out of, and he realizes that we're sinful flesh, and he recognizes that we have need to hear from him, and, and we need to trust him rather than trust ourselves, he pities us. He sees how we are and how we are always off on our own tangents and doing our own thing. And until we come to that place of maturity, we're just little children playing in our sandbox. But as we begin to grow and as we begin to develop, then it's not so much a spanking on the butt, but it's maybe a whacking of the hand when we stick our fingers in fire and say, oh, what's that? No, you don't want to get into that. Whack! <laughs> so whom the Lord chasteneth, that's the ones he loves. So if you're going through trials, that's what it means. God loves you. He didn't leave you the way you are, but he said that he would perform that according to his will of perfecting us and presenting us faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. 
that is God's will. And it's not to leave you as you are, but to present you perfect to God himself. God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore let thy words be few. When you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. They called upon the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O oh, Baal, O oh, Baal, hear us, hear us. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men are, extortioners and unjust, like the adulterers or even as this publican. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up his so much as his head unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. Lord, teach us to pray. And you know, any time that you think you're righteous, you're not. And any time you think you're holy, you're not. Because anything that we have, all that we possess, all that we are, was a gift from God to begin with. God chose us, God saved us, God is redeeming us, and God is perfecting us. And God will justify us in all that we do if we act according to His will and accomplish His purposes. So really, it's going to sound terrible, but it's not about you. It's all about Him and what He's doing in you. So it's kind of a little rough to say it, but, you know, to get with the program is to get rid of yourself and to get Him as priority one. I know that when you're living in this world, it seems so important to be the man or be the woman. <laughs> you know, and take care of the children and find the job and do the thing you know that you think you ought to do. But God knows always in every situation that you're in exactly what you need. So we don't need a thousand prayer lists and chains going around the world with people constantly reminding themselves about what somebody else did or didn't do or how bad they're having it or how good they're having it. God knows what they need. We don't need a prayer chain. We don't need a prayer wall. We don't need a prayer whatever. We just need to let God operate according to His will. And we simply trust Him. I have the simplest of prayers, you know, that I often pray for myself. It's like, God, you know, you take care of it. And that's it. You know, God knows what's best. I don't know. So I just, I'm belligerent. I'm pretty adamant. You know, Lord, okay. You know, heal. That's it. You know, heal him, Lord. And if he does, cool. If he didn't, okay. That was his will. <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. Now, other people may. And, you know, there are times where, yes, I've stood in the marketplace and prayed with all the people and prayed, oh, God, oh, God. You know, and people said, oh, what a beautiful prayer. And I said, yeah, but it didn't go anywhere. Because <laughs> the beautiful prayers don't go anywhere, but the prayer of desperation God immediately hears. Because when you really need, when you really impassion, feel within yourself that desperation for God, God meets you there. But when you just offer up these religious sounding prayers, the Our Fathers, Hail Marys, or whatever you want to pray, or, you know, some language, or even prayer language, I'm sorry, but that's for you, you know? God doesn't need it. God doesn't really want it necessarily. It's just to make you feel better. And the reality is he's already got it under control. So to help yourself to know that he's in control, you need to have conversation. So prayer should be leading you to a place of hearing, not so much speaking. A place of seeing, not so much do it. So when Jesus spent time with his father before the dawn, he watched and he listened to what his father was doing and then he did that during the day. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we did the same? Only doing, only hearing, and only seeing what our father in heaven is doing? I know that's my goal. How about yours?